So this will be a discussion of number five from the 2022 AP Calc BC free response set. One of the questions in the BC free response set is always kind of a hybrid question. It's got a part or two that's uh, AB content and it's got a part or two that's BC only content. And number five from 2022 was the problem that year that was that type. So in this question, it tells us in figures one and two shown above, I don't have both shown. I, I just showed figure one. That's the one that we would have to use in part A here. So that's the only one you see right now. We'll see figure two a little bit later on in the video when we get to a portion of the problem that we need to use it for. Uh, but figures illustrate regions in the first quadrant associated with graphs of one over X and one over X squared respectively. In figure one, we're gonna let R be the region in the first quadrant bounded by the graph of one over X the x-axis and the vertical lines one and five. So here is figure one. So there's the graph of one over x. There's obviously the x-axis, vertical lines, x equals one and x equals five. Uh, we'll talk more about figure two and w a little bit later on. We don't need that in part a. Part a says find the area of region r. This is region r. So if I take a vertical slice of region r, moving that vertical slice back and forth in the region, the top of every slice, is going to be on the function 1 over x. The bottom of every vertical slice is going to be on the x-axis. So the height of my vertical slice is the top y value minus the bottom y value. The width of my vertical slice is some tiny, tiny difference in x values. The approximate area of that slice, if I treat it like a rectangle, is going to be height times width. If I wanted to add together infinitely many of these slices areas, I let the definite integral do its job because by definition, a definite integral adds together infinitely many products that look like this. So I have to do the integral of one over X. Now the Delta X does turn into a DX in its limiting form. And then my X values that I could have potentially drawn slices between are gonna range from the low value of one to the high value of five. Antiderivative of one over X is natural log of the absolute value of X. Toss in the upper limit, toss in the lower limit, take a difference. Uh, this does simplify to natural log of five since the natural log of one is zero. Uh, but what I have boxed up here will be accepted as well. Part B says that region R, so it's region R again. Now you see the graph kind of got behind my work here. There was quite a bit going on here in part B and we'll talk about it momentarily. but uh, region R is the same region that we dealt with in part A. Uh, so for the solid that has its base as region R, at each, each cross section perpendicular to the x-axis, we have a rectangle with area given by this right here. Find the volume of the solid. Now to find the volume of a cross section of the solid, and these cross sections would be taken perpendicularly to the x-axis, to find the volume of a cross section of the solid, we would take the area of the face. Now, this is actually very, very beneficial for us to have access to. They've done all of the geometry that we would normally have to do with labeling dimensions uh, relative to our graphs and, and everything like that. The area of the face of these rectangular cross sections is given by x e to the x over five. I would have to multiply the area of the face of those rectangles by delta x in order to turn that area calculation into a volume calculation for the cross section. And if I want to add together all possible cross sections volumes that span the, the region from the x value of one to the x value of five, I'm going to have to integrate this expression just like we did back in part A. Now this is my answer. Uh, I have a lot of the work that I did to build that answer down here. So I recognized here that I had a product uh, and I wasn't going to be successful with integration by substitution. Uh, well, in Calc BC, integration by parts is a viable alternative when you're dealing with products for doing antiderivatives. So I thought, let's let u equal x. Let's let dv equal the rest of the original integrand. The derivative of u with respect to x is going to be 1. So du is equal to dx. And then the integral of both sides of this is going to give me v on the left. Now, Technically, I do need to do a substitution to find the antiderivative of this, but if I let u equal this exponent, this exponent, excuse me, what I get is I get a derivative of one fifth. That means the factor of five is going to sneak into our antiderivative, and that's where this five here came from. If you have time to do so, you can work out the substitution steps to confirm that this is in fact the antiderivative of 
that right side of the equation there. But then when I go ahead and apply my integration by parts, I've got u. So I, I kind of rearranged some stuff here. u is x, and then times v. So I just took the coefficient 5 out in front of the x, and then the remaining portion of v is right there. So here's uv minus the integral of v, and then du is dx. Right here, this is the integral that we basically did right here. Uh, so another substitution would be necessary. One more time, we pick up the factor of 5. I've already got a 5 here, so the antiderivative of what you're looking at right here is going to be 5 times 5 e to the x over 5. So that's where that 25 came from there. I, I did simplify this, cleaned it up a little bit, just because I, I knew with this antiderivative, what I really did it for was so that I could find my definite integral value, right? This antiderivative is going to get have to get evaluated at the upper limit, at the lower limit, and I'm going to have to take a difference. So when I put 5 in place of all of my x's, I get this. When I subtract off what I get when I put 1 in place of all of my x's, I get this. I have this boxed up. This would receive full credit. This right here depends only on numbers. So we don't have to simplify. If you did want to simplify a little bit, uh, which on the actual AP exam is risky to do and it wastes some time, uh, what you should end up with, what you should see is you should see that this set of parentheses actually contains a zero. This is 25e to the first. This is also 25e to the first. So this is really just a zero. Uh, and if I was to distribute this negative into both items there, I end up with minus 5e to the 1 fifth and then plus 25e to the 1 fifth. So my, my simplified result would be 20e to the 1 fifth. Again, on the AP exam, you don't have to get it to look like that. And then the last part of this finally deals with the other figure. So this is not the same graph that we've been looking at on the first couple of screens in this video. This is figure two, finally, uh, and what tells us that we need to use figure two here is we're no longer dealing with the region R, we are now dealing with the region W. So find the volume of the solid generating when generated when the unbounded region W, and it's unbounded because it starts at the x value of three and extends infinitely out word along the x-axis, but we're thinking about rotating that about the x-axis. So if I was to rotate a vertical slice about the x-axis, what I end up with is I end up with a disk. So for the disk, I'm going to need to find the area of its face. Well, the radius of the disk goes from the top of the slice to the axis that I'm rotating about to generate the disk. So the height of the, the, the radius of the disk is 1 over x squared minus 0, or just 1 over x squared. So the area of the face of my disk is pi times that radius squared. Now the volume of the disk is going to be the area of the face times the thickness. The thickness is some tiny, tiny difference in x values. I did clean this up a little bit, right? So I squared this fraction. I got 1 over x to the fourth. And then I just multiplied pi over 1 times that fraction, which is what you see looking at you right here. Well, to find the volume, I'm going to have to add together infinitely many of those disks' volumes. So I'm going to let the integral do the rest of the work one more time. By definition, it adds together infinitely many products that involve something in delta x. So I did choose to factor the pi out in front of the integral. I had to leave the 1 over x to the fourth inside of it. The delta x turned into a dx. And all of the slices of this region that I could have taken are going to range from the x value of 3 at the low end. And since this is an unbounded region, my high x value would actually trend toward infinity. Now, when you are dealing with an infinite limit of integration, uh, that's what we would refer to as an improper integral. And to get the fundamental theorem of calculus to work for you, you have to replace the limit of integration that is not finite with some variable. I chose the variable s. I typically go with the variable r, but region r was something that was already specified within this problem. So I had to opt for a different variable here. I just went with s. So I, I replace the upper limit with s, and what I eventually want to do is I want to let s approach what it really was originally as a limit of integration. Uh, you see I went ahead and, and set myself up to do an integral with a power rule, right? So rather than 1 over x to the 4th, I've got that written as x to the negative 4th. I'm going to add 1 to that exponent. It's going to go to negative 3. I'm going to divide by the new exponent. So I'm going to have x to the negative 3rd divided by negative 3 when I find this antiderivative. If I simplify that, 
you heard me say negative three, right? Dividing by negative three, and then that x to the negative third, I chose just to bump back across the fraction bar into the denominator. I still have to check a limit as s approaches infinity, so I'd have to put s in place of the x, I'd have to put three in place of the x, and I'd have to take a difference. So when I do that, I can't forget about this pi that I factored out in front, uh, it's still even out in front of the limit even. Uh, can't forget about it, so still have that there, but then when I put s here and then replace the s with infinity, I have negative one divided by infinity, that's a fraction that's trending in value to zero. And then when I subtract off what I get when I put three in, subtracting the negative is gonna turn that into a addition between the terms. So putting three in is gonna be one over this three and then times three cubed. I could have left my answer as pi times one over three times three cubed. I, I can't leave this in my answer. I do have to show that I know that this is really gonna have a value of zero, this initial fraction. Uh, I did simplify this. 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 again, times 3 again, so that's 9 times 9, it's going to get me to 81. Pi over 1 times 1 over 81 gets me to pi over 81 for this converging improper integral.